please be seated. Uh, soon we uh, will be going to start our next session. I request all the participants to please come so that we can start our session. Welcome back after lunch. We will be continuing the session on disease biology and healthcare. So, uh, our next speaker of the session is Alexander Vladimirovich, researcher from Federal State Pashri Institution, Ruler Research First Institute of, of Maternal and Infant Health. He will be presenting on genetic profile of enterobacteria with different degrees of antibiotic resistance and virulence associated from patient's perinatal center. He'll be presenting online. Uh, may I request you to please turn on the camera? Mr. Alexander. I would like to express my gratitude for the opportunity to speak today. In my presentation, I would, would, would like to focus on researchers in medical microbiology. I will talk about enterobacteria, their virulence and antibiotic resistant genes. Klebsiella pneumonia is one of the most common members of enterobacteria family. They are the causative agents of several types of infections in humans, including respiratory tract infections, urinary tract infections, and bloodstream infections. The study of Klebsiella pneumonia is currently relevant. This article confirms this. It was published in Nature in November 2022. It compares the genomes of hospital and non-hospital strains. It has been established that population exist separately and don't mix. In our study we used the classical bacteriological method. Material from patients was sown on nutrient. We studied enzymes and antibiotic susceptibility. Virulence and antibiotic resistant genes were detected using real time PCR. We have sequenced some genes according to Sanger. The picture shows a microbiology laboratory and some search instrument. Klebsiella pneumonia are divided into classical and Hypervirulence. Classical Klebsiella pneumonia is more often associated with antibiotic resistance. They meet in a hospital environment. Hypervirulent strains have a capsule. The capsule protects agents phagocytes. That's why such strains are more likely to cause 
invasive infections in non-hospitalized people. The dynamic of uh, isolation of ESBL producing strains in um, undulating. We researched seven species of enterobacteria and detected various genes of antibiotic resistance. We also found a combination of antibiotic resistant genes. Two genes come on is um, in Escherichia coli. A combination of antibiotic resist genes is more often detected in strains of Klebsiella pneumonia. The number of identified genes is increasing every year. We have detected several um, virulence factor genes. First, involved in uh, iron use. Second is involved in the synthesis of uh, lipopolysaccharide. Fin is involved in synthesis of uh, fimbria and adhesion to the substrate. Last gens is involved in the synthesis of the capsule and provides lipovirulence. The UG gen dominated among all virulence factor gens. The UG gen was first sequenced in 2019 in our organization. In this study we analyzed 48 strains. They grouped into 11 clusters. Five mother-child pair pairs studied. Strains show higher genetic relatedness in four classes. Strains from mother and child were different in one class. Two clusters combined strains isolated from the faces and blood of own patients. This study demonstrated the generogenicity uh, of population of Klebsiella pneumonia strains. This confirms the effectiveness of anti-epidemic measures. We deposit some nucleotide sequences in the International Bank of Genetic Information. You can find them and use them in your research. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Now we move on to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker for today's session is Xiao Yan Liu, postdoc from Department of Hematology, Zwangen Hospital of Wuhan University. The title Liu's talk is Chronic HIV Infection Induces Aberrant Myeloid Lineage Differentiation and Susceptibility to Leukemogenesis. We presenting online. Can I request you to please turn on your camera? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate in the forum. The subject of my presentation is Trionic HIV infection induces a very minor lineage differentiation and the susceptibility to nucleomagenesis. Hematopoietic progenitor cells consist of a heterogeneous population of cells that include hematopoietic stem cells, capable for producing of non-cell lineages. As we all know, HIV infection not only leads to a compromised immune system, but also disrupt normal hematopoiesis. However, 
the magnesium is not clear. We have provided a new possible perspective on HIV-induced minor suppression and the occurrence of leukemia based on a large amount of clinical data. Of 783 HIV patients enrolled in the study, 509 were tested for a lymphocyte subject. And they were divided into four groups according to CD4 positive T cells. Com comparison of a peripheral blood cell between each group, we found that WBC plat plat platinate lymphocytes were decreased with the reduction of CD4 T cells and the incidence of nocapenil and anemia was increased with the reduction of CD4 T cells, while the incidence of neutropenil did not change significantly. In the bone marrow, the granulocyte proportion was increased with decreased progression, while the astrocyte cells proportion was decreased with disease progression. In order to analyze whether this lineage bias has occurred in an earlier stage, we analyzed the bone marrow HSPCs, and the result showed that the granulocyte progenitors were significantly higher in HIV patients compared to healthy persons. We analyzed the risk factors for HIV deaths in 425 patients, and the result showed that uh, leukemia was an in, in, independent risk factor for deaths in HIV patients. The survival time of HIV patients with leukemia was significantly shorter than that of HIV patients with, without malignant, malignant disease. To explore the molecular mechanisms and underlying myeloid differentiation bias and the nucleogenesis of HIV patients, we performed RNA se se sequencing. And the results showed FOS, FOS B, and Gen D, which were members of the AP1 complex, and the positive modulating myeloid differenti differentiation were enriched in the top 10 fold, fold change trans transcription factors in HIV and uh, leukemia patients. Moreover, the result also showed significant changes in the cytokine profile after HIV infection, including KLG, CXDL12, VCAM1, SPP1, and uh, CSF1. Later, the RTP RTPs are verified these changes. It has reported that AP1 expression can be promoted by activation extracellular response ERK under oxidative stress. The uh, our bone marrow biopsy showed that zinc phosphorylation was in increased in HIV and uh, leukemia uh, patients. To further confirm, confirm the role of HIV infection on the differentiation and the gene expression of HSPCs, we enriched normal bone marrow CD134 positive cells followed by HIV infection in vivo. And the, the changes in, pa in HIV patients was all verified. At last, HIV-infected CD13-4 CD positive cells were treated with zinc inhibitor, and the result suggested that HIV infection elevated the level of oxidative stress which promotes the expression of transcription complex AP1 by activating zinc, causing changes in cytokines such as MCSF, 
that that's leading to the myeloid differentiation bias and the suspective sus susceptibility to nucleomyogenesis. That's just uh, antioxidative treatment or gene inhibition may reduce the risk of nucleomyogenesis in HIV patients. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Now we'll be moving to our next speaker, Pinieva Anastasia Nicoliviana. She is the head of Division of Development and Implementation Innovation in Semi Industrial Technologies, Chomoko Federal Scientific Center for Research and Development of Immune and Biological Products, Russian Academy of Science. The title of her talk is Platforms for the Development of Vaccines and Therapeutic Drugs for the treatment of infectious diseases. She'll be presenting online. I request her to join and turn on her camera. Can you please raise your hand so that we can identify you? Yeah, she. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. My name is Pnia Anastasia. I am head of Division for Development and Implementation of Innovative and Semi-Industrial Technologies. I am thankful for the honor of presenting this report concerning platforms for the development of vaccines and therapeutic drugs for the treatment of infectious disease. In my report, I would like to say about all the areas of activity that young scientists are working on at Chimakov Federal Scientific Center for Research and Development of Immune and Biological Products of Russian Academy of Science. At the beginning of my report, I would like to say that the implementation of all stages of drug development at the Chmokov Center is carried out thanks to the unique structure of the center, which unites the research and development departments, the preclinical research center, production facilities, and the WHO Regional Reference Laboratory for Polio. The work of the Chmokov Center is to conduct fundamental and apply research in the following areas. Development and production of vaccines, scientific research, education, diagnosis of viral disease, epidemiological studies, development of diagnostic tools, and preclinical trials. More than 80% of the staff are young scientists in the development department. We work under the guidance of eminent experienced scientists. Our young scientists have already successfully implemented several projects. For example, an inactivated polio vaccine based on Sabine strains, polio vaccine, and an inactivated coronavirus vaccine, Coivac. During the last eight years, we have developed a biotechnological vaccine platform based on microcarrier growth of viral cells in bioreactors. These cells could be infected with different viruses to collect viral suspension, which is the basis of whole virion vaccines. Oral polio, inactivated polio, tick-borne encephalitis, COVID-19 vaccine, and other vaccines. Together with whole virion platform, we are developing VLP-based vaccine platforms. Virus-like particles are particles containing structured viral proteins, which induce immune response but lack genetic material. That make VLP uninfectious. That's why manufacture process of VLP vaccines is safe in contrast to, to live or inactivated vaccines. On the other hand, VLP vaccines and inactivated vaccines both have similar autogenic composition, safety and control autogenic load. 
We are developing several platforms to produce VLP vaccines based on plant and Bakula virus expression systems. Both of systems are linked to this construction of recombinant plasmids and causing viral genes. Recombinant plasmids are then transferred into cells. In the case of plants, transfer is performed with agrobacterium. After viral protein production in cells, viral particles assemble and can be purified for vaccine formulation. A new project we started recently in our department is development of recombinant monoclonal antibodies using fact display technology. These techniques allow us to isolate specific antibodies to a wide range of molecular targets. Applications vary from therapeutic drugs against different diseases to their use in high quality diagnostic systems. One of the most promising products we developed is monoclonal single-chain human antibody against SARS-CoV-2. Protective studies on hamster model showed its ability to reduce RNA viral load in the group of treated animals and significantly reduced pathological effects of virus pathogenicity in lung tissue. Preclinical studies of new drugs are carried out in our own preclinical center. The center specialized in evaluating the efficacy of biologics, therapeutics, and vaccines in various animal models, rodents, mammals, including primates. Research is conducted in teams and collaborative science to develop and to utilize reproducible preclinical studies in the development of effective therapeutics, diagnostics, and prevention for infectious disease. Since the foundation of our center, we have been sharing knowledge and technology with the whole world. Today, we carry our technology transfer according to the world generally accepted standards. Our scientific center operates in accordance with international GMP standards. It is the largest manufacturer of yellow fever vaccine in the world. We are supplier to WHO and UNICEF. I want to say again, it is a great honor for me to make a rapid at such an important meeting. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Now we have among us Dr. Shiva Basu, who is a co-chair of the session. Dr. Basu is an associate professor at Neuroscience Unit at JNCSR. Now moving on to our next speaker, Yong Yung Zhu, associate professor at Heron Institute of Technology. The title we'll be presenting is Intestinal Regulatory T-Cell Induction by Beta Elimin elevates the formation of flat tissue related inflammation. We'll be presenting online. Can you please raise your hand so that we can identify you and allow the access? Camera access? She's there. Yeah. Yeah, she's there. Yeah. Can you please raise your hand? Okay, she's not there online. We'll continue. Hello, everyone. My name is Ying Yu Zhou. I come from the Harbin Institute of Technology. Today, I will give the presentation named the Intestinal Regulatory T cell Induction by beta elimin elevates the formation of fat tissue related inflammation. First of all, I will give some introduction of my study. As a kind of chronic low-grade inflammation, obesity can trigger a lot of disease, such as, such as the type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, cardiovascular diseases, even those various tumors. Betalimi as a chemical that comes from the herb Arihazoma, uh, Doria, and it is proved to be effective against a broad range of cancers clinically. As we all know, it died, uh, tumor microenvironment will come from the uh, inflammatory mediators, which uh, indicated that the tied 
uh, regula re regulations between the tumor and the inflammation. So we got a question that whether beta alanine also have some effects on um, on the inflammation because of its effects on inhibiting the tumor. Let's come to the immune immune system. Dendritic cells will present exogenous uh, uh, antigens on the MHC2 uh, to the uh, CD4 T cells. And the CD4 T cells will secrete a lot of uh, cytokines such as the L10, TGF beta, L13, L4, integrin uh, alpha. Uh, TNF alpha, L6, L1, CCL, CCL2. All of these uh, cytokines will contribute, contribute to the uh, macrophages polarization, which, uh, uh, which determines the anti inflammatory or pro inflammatory status. So, all of these uh, uh, immune cell subsets. Uh, all of the balance of uh, all the balance of all of the uh, immune substances will contribute to the uh, chronic low grade inflammation, uh, especially for the regulatory T cells that will have the effects of inhibiting the inflammation. We give uh, opacity models such as the slide showed. We found that beta limit did not uh, influence the most body weight, but regulated the inflammatory cytokines such as the TNF alpha and the gamma, L1 beta, L6 in the epididymal uh, adipose tissue and the mesenteric adipose tissue. Furthermore, we studied the strong vascular cells, which is a kind of immune, a uh, kind of cells that uh, contain a lot of immune immune cell subsets to study the immune system response. We also found that the cellular results that beta-alumin can modify the inflammation-related cytokines in the strong vascular cells of the white adipose tissue, including the MAT or the EAT. Moreover, we studied the macro, macrophages and the, uh, the regulatory T cells, the two kinds of uh, immune, immune cell subsets uh, will contribute to to the uh, to inhibit the inflammation, which caused by the ob uh, obesity, we can find that we can find that the beta the beta can balance the M one and M two adipose tissue macrophages and induce the regulatory T cells expression in the white adipose tissue. But when we study the mechanisms we of beta alanine on inhibiting the inflammation which caused by its obesity, we found that uh, found that beta alanine did not directly decrease the LPS induced uh, vascular cells inflammation in vitro, such as we showed in this slide. So we can there uh, there existed uh, another kind of the uh, immune regulation. Regulation uh, process that will explain why why does the beta alanine have the effects on inhibiting the oxidation uh, induced inflammation. Let's come to the intestinal immune system. The con conversion from the naive T cells to the regulatory T cells will uh, come from the some materials which come which come from the dendritic cells such as the uh, TGF beta one and the TGF beta one uh, were was uh, meditated meditated by the integrin alpha we beta eight uh, expression and another kind of rhodia two which come from the vitamin A will also contribute to the regulatory T cells expression. And we found that uh, exactly uh, for the intestinal uh, lymph nodes such as the Papunches or mesenteric lymph nodes also will be regulated by the uh, beta alanine administration. We can see from this bar chart is that beta alanine has a uh, 
significant effects on regulating the regulatory cells and in the environment or PP. So we got that maybe beta-amine can upregulate the FOXP3 positive, CD4 positive T cells in the intestinal immune system. And then we also found that all the uh, dietetic cells, the mediators that will contribute to the regulatory T cells expression, uh, will uh, regulated by the beta-amine. Uh, Administration such as the TGF beta one, beta two, integral alpha V, integral beta eight, and alton. Furthermore, we also found that uh, the beta enemy will enhance the rod two activity and uh, the upregulated RA level in the intestinal dietetic cells. We were also suggested by the increased um, by the proportion of RA. Are a uh, dependent alpha four beta seven positive CCR nine positive P cells in the uh, CD four positive P cells under the beta amine treatment, and not only the intestinal intestinal uh, uh, immune system, but also the own bodies uh, own body system will be uh, regulated by the beta amine, such as the spleen. So we can go that maybe beta amine will upregulate the regulatory T cells in the intestinal immune system through the enhanced of TGF beta one L ten integral alpha V beta eight and rod H two. So, uh, we can got the conclusion that the intestinal uh, regulatory T cell induction by the beta amine elevates the formation of fine tissue related inflammation. So, uh, the study also gave a give us a new sense that maybe uh, to balance the immune or uh, the intestinal immune system will contribute to inhibiting the inflammation, which caused by the ob obesity. That's all. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Moving on, our next speaker is Okulova Ekaterina Ogvalena, researcher from Bureau Rural Scientific Research Institute of Maternity and Child Care Public Health, Ministry of Russian Federation, and will be talking on molecular biological model for predictive for predicting post-operative decrease in ovarian reserve in patients of reproductive age with deep infiltrative endometriosis. She'll be attending online. If you are unaware, can you Allow please me raise to your present hand? our report, the molecular biological model for predicting postoperative decrease in ovarian reserve in patients of reproductive age with deep infiltrative endometriosis. Every tenth women of reproductive age suffer from endometriosis, and about half of them suffer from infertility. Among the various factors that determine infertility in women. The most important is the depletion of the pool of residual ovarian follicles. In recent years, scientists agree that the presence of endometrioid ovarian cysts, as well as the surgical removal, causes a persistent decrease in ovarian reserve. However, the literature regarding the impact of deep infiltrative endometriosis and its surgical treatment on ovarian reserve is extremely limited. There is no agreement in the world professional community on the need for surgical treatment as first-line therapy in patients with deep infiltrative endometriosis in combination with impaired fertility. Therefore, the aim of our study was to develop based on machine learning a computer program for predicting changes in ovarian reserve after surgical treatment of deep infiltrative endometriosis. A prospective longitudinal comparative study was conducted, the dicing of which is present on the slide. Surgical treatment of deep infiltrative endometriosis was performed in 70 patients of reproductive age, of which 30 patients 
had a combination of deep infiltrative endometriosis with ovarian endometrioma. Even at the preoperative stage, a significant decrease in ovarian reserve was revealed in patients with deep infiltrative endometriosis. This was manifested by a significantly lower level of AMH compared with fertile women, regardless of the presence of ovarian endometrioma. According to ultrasound date, the number of antral follicles in the ovaries of the preoperative stage was also significantly lower in patients with deep infiltrative endometriosis than in patients of the comparison group. The presence of ovarian endometrioma had an ever more negative effect on this indicator. Six months after surgery, there was further significant decrease in ovarian reserve in patients with deep infiltrative endometriosis compared with baseline values before surgery. This situation was observed in half of the patients, despite the fact that the initial indicator of ovarian reserve in the group were comparable. The ovarian reserve significantly decreased both in patients who underwent endometrioma cystectomy and in patients with intact ovaries. It is known that endometriosis has future open malignant tumor, including avoidance of apoptosis, neuroangiogenesis, and cell migration. The hypothesis that the mechanism may play a role both in progression of endometriosis and in the reduction of ovarian reserve in this disease. The hypothesis was confirmed by the analysis, analysis of tissue expression of markers of some pathways of apoptosis and angiogenesis in the granulosa tissue of ovarian follicles in these patients. According to the re results of the molecular genetic typing, it was found that the carriage of polymorphisms of the present genes that regulate apoptosis and angiogenesis is associated with the risk of developing deep infiltrative endometriosis. Using the bioinformatic method of multifactorial dimension reduction, a three locus model for predicting the risk of developing deep infiltrative endometriosis was formed. Using the CAD boost machine learning model, clinical and genetical predictors of postoperative decrease in ovarian reserve in patients of reproductive age with deep infiltrative endometriosis were selected. The web application has an accessible interface for easy use by obstetrics and gynecologists to determine the tactics of managing patients with deep infiltrative endometriosis. Based on the date entered, the program displays the total risk calculation results, which, which uh, is present in two options, high risk and low risk of a decrease in ovarian reserve. Patients with deep infiltrative endometriosis and a low risk of postoperative decrease in ovarian reserve at the first stage can be surgically treated. If a patient's, if a patient's has a high risk of postoperative decrease in ovarian reserve before surgical treatment, the women may be offered banking of oocytes or embryos in programs of assisted reproductive technologies. In this way, surgical treatment of deep infiltrative endometriosis leads to a decrease in the initially compromised ovarian reserve in patients of reproductive age, regardless of the presence of endometrioid ovarian damage. In the reduction of ovarian reserve after surgical treatment of deep infiltrative endometriosis, a genetically determined dysregulation of apoptosis and angiogenesis plays a significant role. The developed computer model for predicting the risk of postoperative decrease in ovarian reserve in patients with deep, deep infiltrative endometriosis can help the obstetric and gynecologist and reproductologist in choose the op optimal management tactics for the successful implementation of reproductive function. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the interesting talk. Now we move to our next speaker, Hao Yu Gao, lecturer from Shengdu Medical College, will be discussing the development of sustainable healthy diets in China from a maternal and infant nutrition perspective. Be presenting online. Can you please raise your hand 
so that we can identify you and allow the camera access. Hello everyone, I'm glad to be here to share with you part of my research ideas. My name is Hao Yue Gao, I'm working at Chengdu Medical College. My research field is maternal and child nutrition. The topic of my presentation today is discussing the development of sustainable healthy diets in China from a maternal and infant nutrition perspective. This is a table of contents. Firstly, I will give you a general introduction about the definition of sustainable healthy diets. The concept of a sustainable healthy diet are dietary patterns that promote all dimensions of an individual's health and well-being, have low environmental pressure and impact, are accessible, affordable, safe, and equitable and are culturally acceptable. That means the term sustainable healthy diet contains two aspects, sustainability and healthness of diets. It is a holistic approach to diets, including nutrition recommendation, the environmental costs of food production, and the adaptability to local social, cultural, and economic contexts. Let's have a look at the problems in this field. Malnutrition in all its forms and the degradation of the environment and natural resources are the two major challenges in this field. Reports show that globally, the number of undernourished people has been slowly increasing for several years, while the number of overweight and obese people is increasing at an alarming rate. Meanwhile, the way people produce and consume food is having an impact on the environment and natural resources. The food system counts for a large proportion of greenhouse gas emission and is a major cause of land conversion, deforestation, biodiversity loss. To achieve Global goals for nutrition and diet-related non-communicable disease control and sustainable development goals, it is essential to improve people's eating habits and food choices. However, a diet is more than the sum of nutrients and food consumption. It is a way of life that unfolds through the production, sourcing, distribution, marketing, selection, preparation, and consumption patterns of food. Regional solutions are required to address the availability, accessibility, and consumption of food in different social contexts. Consistent with global trends, the three major problems of malnutrition among Chinese residents are undernutrition, micronutrient deficiencies, and overweight and obesity. People are ditching healthier traditional diets in favor of modern diets, consuming large amounts of overprocessed foods, which are high in saturated fat, sugar, sodium, energy density, but low in micronutrient and dietary fiber. The high carbon emission food consumption structure in economically developed regions is becoming increasingly prominent. To achieve China's dual carbon goals, it is important to guide the residents' diets towards a low carbon and sustainable direction. What can we do to solve these problems? In 2020, Chinese experts have condensed three key scientific issues on national nutrition and food security, and the construction of the sustainable food system 
and Green Consumption Society is one of them. Previous studies have mainly analyzed the evolution characteristics of per capita food consumption of Chinese residents from the perspective of the ecological environment, such as carbon emissions. However, this type of research does not provide specific guidelines and evaluation methods for the sustainable healthy diet structure of different spatial populations. According to psychological research on food choices, spatial life stages such as the reproductive period and early life are one of the best time for people to change their long-term eating habits. Childhood is a formative period that lays the foundation for a sustainable, healthy diet. Therefore, I selected mother and child as the research subjects. From this chart, you could see the total dietary energy intake of Finland women was close to the dietary reference intakes. But too much energy came from fat. Most micronutrient intakes were only about 60% of the reference intakes. Due to the popularity of fried dishes and hot pot in the local area, the excessive intake of cooking oil has become a common problem. As a result, excessive weight gain during pregnancy is common, especially in urban areas. Excessive gestational weight gain is often associated with the occurrence of cesarean sections. Unsurprisingly, the prevalence of cesarean section was up to 67% in the study area. As cesarean section can cause a delay in initiation of breastfeeding, the prevalence of exclusive breastfeeding of newborns was not optimistic. In summary, in the process of choosing food and feeding mode, Mothers hardly considered factors such as consumption of natural resources and environmental contaminations. Neither the no prevalence of exclusive breastfeeding nor the excessive gestational weight gain was in line with the concept of sustainable development. In the future study, we will keep working on the actual situation of the spatial population of women and children to find out practical solutions based on the concept of moderate food intake, food safety, green and no carbon consumption patterns, and traditional culture. From a different perspective, relevant strategies, policies, and legal frameworks could be deduced through demand so as to explore the specific connotation of a sustainable healthy diet in Chinese social contexts. It will provide policy suggestions for promoting the sustainable development of low-carbon diets for women and children in China. These are references. Thanks for listening. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Now moving on with the last speaker for today's session is Barkhan Atrikzeva from National University of Uzbekistan. And the title of the talk is Polymeric Materials as a Type of Suture Material for Emergency Cases. Can you please raise the hand? Good day. My, My name is Barnahon Artikhajaeva and I am a researcher in biotechnology. Let me introduce our topic named Polymeric Material is a type of suture material for emergency cases. Over the past 20 years, biodegradable polymers have found wide applications in the variety of biomedical applications, including targeted transportation of drugs, gene delivery, tissue engineering, 
antibacterial and antifoling surgical bare materials. Polymeric carriers are used as epi and endermatic patches as well as instead of fixing surgical dressing on the skin and treating minor skin lesions as well as for problematic skin care. At the same time, it should be noted that despite the saturation of the market with various forms of bare polymer agents, the need for bare carriers is increasing and much attention is paid to the research and study of the development of skin patches that meet modern requirements to a greater extent. This is due to the fact that the increase in population and the rapid development of nanotechnologies in the field of biomedicine uh, revealed at least two reasons that reduce the effectiveness of excited commercial poly polymer patches. Firstly, the carriers should have an instant effect on the skin in the form of softening, moisturizing, masking skin imperfections. They must also have reinforcing properties of the agent and have the most valuable property to form a film. Secondly, the polymer carriers must be elasticity, stability and straight. The purpose of the study was creation of a carrier based on the polymer film with nanoparticles, including study of the optimal conditions of the synthetic of a polymer carrier, quantitative determination of the concentration of uh, silver nanoparticles, study of physical chemical properties, toxicity and skin tissue tolerance, and also studies of the irritant effect of the carrier on laboratory animals. The adhesive properties of polymer are one of the most important criteria for selecting the optimal film base since it determines the strength of fixation of the drug at the site of application. The duration of the therapeutic effect of the drug directly depends on the strength of the adhesive compound. See if it slips or peels off from the place of application, the therapeutic effect decreases or completely disappears. We conducted a study of the adhesive properties of a polymer solution with 10 types of solvents and a change in the ratio of the concentration of the active substance and solvent. We also carried out morphological studies of the fiber surface using scanning electron microscope. Taking into account the fact that the sample under study is the electric one, it is required to carry out disposition of the electrically conductive metal layer. A silver target was used as a metal. Deposition was carried out in an uh, ergon gas medium. Next, we selected the concentration of silver nanoparticles to ensure the antibacterial action of the film. The selection of silver ions was carried out in various concentrations and we could observe the super region of the pathogenic microflora. Studies were carried out for nine types of microorganisms, including four pathogenic. The main quality that polymers selected for medical devices should have is biocompatibility, which is characterized by the absence of toxicity and effective function through the use. Toxicity is a complex of phenomena occurring in vivo, which may include direct self damage and physiological effect. We carried out study of the acute toxicity uh, of the carried polymer on the skin according to the Noakis and Sanderson method and study of single and repeated irritant effect, the study of hypersensitive effect by the method of closed skin applications by Bueller. Study of the acute toxicity of the carrier polymer carried by the method of Noakis and Sanderson. For the study, rates of the both sexes were taken with the weight of 180 to 192 grams. The impact of the drug was carried out in the concentration of the active substance from 0.001 to 0.05 grams per kilogram of animal weight. In parallel with monitoring the irritant effect of the skin of the animal, the profile and activity of the animal was were studied. The persistent values uh, was the value obtained on days 1st, 3rd and 5th after the experiment. Changes in the behavior of animals and concentrations of 0.001 to 0.01 were not observed. At the concentration of 0.05, the death of the animal occurred and this indicator was taken as a lethal dose. 
We also studied the adhesive properties of the vessels. Modeling of experimental pathology was carried out under euthanasia using carbon dioxide. After fixing the animal, cleaning and processing the surgical field, an operative excess was formed by a skin incision in the neck along the projection line of the trachea. The restoration of the carotid artery was occlusion was carried out. Here, the depend of the density of the skin carrier as well as the exposure time of the rate of film formation was investigated, since the density of the solution affects the biodegradability of the drug. Uh, all studies uh, of the Guiana pigs and rabbits in accordance with the requirements of the ethical committee. Thank you for your attention here in my context and I will be happy to answer to your questions. Thank you for the wonderful talk. With this, we come to an end of our session on disease biology and healthcare. A big round of applause for all the participants. So now we'll begin with the question answer session and online participants also please post your questions and we will be taking all your questions. Are there any questions? Thank you. I have a question to a very interesting uh, topic about this uh, clinical response to available therapy um, and uh, uh, not responding uh, uh, to the chemotherapy of this cancer <clears throat> patients. As I have uh, uh, made of uh, mine, that is a very interesting topic also. And um, uh, my question is, um, um, is it uh, possible to uh, predict in any um, uh, medicaments already uh, passed uh, tests on, uh, on, on uh, not mice, but humans? And is it possible to implement it already to, uh, to a person? In, in real, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, a nice question. So actually, uh, the model which I have shown you, it is actually has been uh, studied from past three, two decades. So people have actually shown that uh, the acquisition of resistors becomes uh, because of the small population of cells, uh, which have like stem like features. So it has already been clinically proved. And there are a lot of uh, research going on around the globe for this. And there are certain uh, American companies who actually started, you know, discovering new agents which can actually selectively target these uh, stem-like cells. And this uh, is that is what the proof is. It is only uh, many studies have shown they have actually got the clinical samples from the patients, and uh, when they were not responding to these therapies and uh, they found that this particular portion of cells, which uh, have like stem-like features, have been actually uh, you know increased in those patients, and uh, then they treat those cells uh, in mouse models and or in vitro in lab lab conditions, and have shown yes, they actually the resistance which these patients have shown was because of those cells. So it has a good clinical significance as well. Thank you so much, and I wanted to uh, thank all. all participants of this section also because it is uh, <laughs> impact to all humanity and that is really great and impressive because uh, we are not in this uh, area and that is very impressive. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I will have the question for the last uh, speaker. 
Uh, could you tell, please, uh, do you work only with polymer materials or maybe with uh, minerals materials too, for example, apatite, which is have uh, good recommendations for tooth implants? Uh, thank you for your question. No, we work only with polymer materials before we start the literature. And uh, from literature, we know that some polymer materials are used in the medicine before, but we uh, check the uh, pluses and minuses, and that's why we choose all these polymer materials as the um, active uh, component of our material. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is to Zia Yon Lim. Are you online there? Uh, uh, who talked about chronic HIV infection induces aberrant myeloid lineage differentiation? Are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was a very nice talk. So, um, um, are you planning to extend this study to any other cancer? And if yes, do you think it's always like there is an interaction between virus infection and how the cancer progresses? Because in case of um, HPV infected head and neck cancer, what it is reported that HPV infected head and neck cancer patient survival is better than the ones which are not infected. But in your case, it looks different uh, i mean it's reverse so are you planning to extend it to any other cancer uh, sorry can you speak slowly yeah so right now you're working with aml and you have shown that how hiv infection induces the aml differentiation so are you planning to extend this study or look at the level of HIV infection and how HIV infection can promote cancer progression in any other cancer? Uh, uh, yes, uh, we we were planning to <clears throat> uh, we were planning to uh, do the experiment on um, view uh, animal animal models to <clears throat> uh, to verify the HIV and uh, uh, cancers. Uh, example, in, um, my myeloid malignancies in, in future. Uh, but which cancer? Um, acute myeloid leukemia. Yeah, it's the same one, uh, not any other cancer. The question I asked was because of HPV infection in head and neck cancer. So again, in head and cancer, HPV infection helps in better survival. So I was wondering whether the um, interaction between virus and host it's similar in different cancer. Uh, yes, um, uh, maybe we will focus on market high myeloma. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. I have a question for Anastasia, if she's online. Yes, I'm here. Hi, uh, Anastasia. Is, uh, uh, so I have one question. Since the we know there is uh, there are mRNA vaccines nowadays, so why do you think the VLPs will be an effective platform for uh, making these vaccines, where we know that uh, these structural proteins are highly uh, prone to mutations? Uh, what kind of inactivated vaccine do you mean? Uh, coronavirus uh, is for uh, anesthesia, anesthesia. Uh, for the uh, vaccine for development. Uh, yes, I am here. It's me. Uh, what kind of uh, vaccine do you mean? Uh, will it be vaccine for uh, what kind of disease? So I'm I'm uh, I'm asking since you mentioned about the VLPs uh, for vaccine development. Uh, since we uh, have now developed uh, these mRNA vaccines, which may be uh, targeting the non-structural proteins, which are less prone to mutations compared to the structural proteins, which are more prone to mutations mutations in case of various strains of viruses that we are seeing in case of SARS-CoV-2, for example. So why do you think that mm -hmm. VLP will be a better uh, strategy for vaccine development? Um, but our research uh, 
from our research, uh, we know that uh, uh, our VLP vaccine has uh, um, full antigenic uh, load uh, and uh, we have a very good uh, immune response. Uh, I would like to know more from Aista Mishra. Uh, you have mentioned about the gene uh, that EGLN1, uh, whether it's associated only with this hypoxia or any other functions, uh, it's having that particular gene. And also, what's your future research uh, upon this particular gene? Okay, thanks for the question. So this uh, EGLN1 is basically a prolyl hydroxylase, okay? And it's an enzyme which is oxygen dependent dioxygenase. Now this enzyme basically hydroxylate not just HIV, but many other more enzymes such as demethylases, such as TETS. So it is also important, this enzyme or this gene is also important, not just uh, in you know HIV responses, but in other epigenetic responses also that are actually uh, involved in hypoxia so therefore this gene is actually important and apart from just seeing it as a you know in a, a, a just for high altitude we can also see this gene for other cancers where hypoxia is explicitly involved or in other cardiovascular respiratory diseases where again hypoxia is involved it could be a cause it could be a consequence so that way this gene has a lot many uh, you know it's involved in many pathways um, my lab, we are actually interested uh, in genetic as well as epigenetic variants and uh, of course we are trying to take this gene further because this gene is the only gene that has shown a natural selection in one of the segment in all the high altitude population be it Tibetan or be it and Andean. So this gene actually is very important. So we are trying to you know uh, go further into this gene and to just see if it could be used as a diagnostic or a screening marker that way thank you are there any other questions i have a question to Suli Kin. i'm sorry if i'm misspelling your name and surname uh, you mentioned in your uh, presentation that this tannic acid uh, derived antifolin and all this met your methodology <clears throat> is uh, helpful to uh, resistive uh, staphylococcus aureus and is it uh, do you have any uh, results and statistic uh, with uh, in this thematics <clears throat> thank you If you are online with uh, this um, presentation, tannic acid derived uh, antifluorine and bacterial surface. <clears throat> He's not online. Su Lekun, are you online? Uh, if you could hear my question. Yeah. Okay, he's not online. I have a few questions on behalf of the um, chairs. They'll be here soon. This was Saurish Ghosh. Um, you mentioned development of therapeutics using antibodies from mother's milk. Um, can you expand on that? 
So actually, uh, the secretary IGA is uh, has been seen to maximally uh, help in clearing uh, clearance of the enteric viruses, and not only enteric viruses, any kind of enteric pathogens. So uh, since th these neonates, uh, it's very difficult uh, to vaccinate very early stage in their life uh, after ju just their birth. So on that uh, note, where if the mothers can be vaccinated and the antibodies can be released from the mother's milk to the uh, neonates, then these kind of protection can be uh, transferred to the babies. And not only that, uh, these kind of antibodies can, uh, if transferred, it also shapes uh, along, uh, uh, the immune system of the babies. Thank you. And the uh, second uh, uh, chair also wanted to ask, how does the stomach virus reach the salivary gland? So actually, the stomach viruses don't reach the salivary gland. Those are independent pathways, which are uh, like infecting two different tissues. So uh, those infections are acquired independently? Yes. Thank you. And the next question for, from the chair is for Nikol Nikolovich. Um, this is about the laser procedure. And the question is, uh, um, laser procedures are widely used. So can you elaborate on what is the novelty in this procedure? Is it the difference due to cost? Or is this kind of an equipment available to do this kind of a procedure? Thank you very much for the question. I'm Alexei. Uh, so uh, indeed, this procedure is already quite regular. Uh, the classical type was penetrating keratoplasty or, post uh, or posterior keratoplasty when a transplant is uh, procured by the uh, mechanical microkeratome. Uh, but in the next generation of uh, the technology, when you create a transplant by laser, which is more predictable, uh, and the results are quite good. And uh, yes, it's a regular procedure. In India, uh, I think that you have corneal transplantations, maybe about 5,000, I think. But yeah. I can make a mistake because I don't know the exact uh, um, uh, the, the, that number. In Russia, we make about 2,000. In okay. USA, about 20,000. So no special equipment is required for this? Yes, if to, you, you, requ you, you need femtosecond laser. Laser, of course. Yes, is and it's quite expensive. expensive. Yeah. It's quite expensive, but it was Russian model. Okay. And uh, if some lasers from which which are made in some other countries, uh, you need a pack to start each, each time. You pay each time just to turn it on. For this, no, no. you just push a button. And it's a big difference. And it works quite good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next questions from the chairs are for Fayaz Malik. Uh, first question is uh, Paclitaxel and the IAM152 uh, uh, showed interesting results. So what are you planning to do with it? At what stage is it? How is the toxicity? Are you planning to take it to clinical trials? Yes, uh, actually, uh, we have taken this molecule uh, you know, quite forward right now. And uh, we have done all the preclinical studies which are needed. So it is in the phase of, we are in the phase of filing the IND right now. Great. And uh, the second question is, you showed a lot of molecules for cancer and uh, some for depression as well, which are very interesting results. But do you know what is the mode of action, the mechanism of these molecules? How are yes, they working? Uh, the molecule which we are uh, currently you know, proposing for the IND filing and for preclinical studies is actually targeting mint, mint pathway. So it's actually targeting beta catenin, you know, it, it stops beta catenin to go into the nucleus. So that's the actual mechanism. Like GSK3 beta. Yeah, signal. absolutely. Yeah, it's like that. Yeah. Um, also, the other question is uh, when you have different, different molecules working uh, in cancer or depression, is there a connection between the way they're targeting different pathways? Are they yes. similar? No, 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 it's all, di all the different ways Excellent. of targeting, yeah. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Next question from the chairs I have is for Asta. Um, so, uh, the interesting question. So, do people who are the natives of uh, mountainous regions uh, do not have mutations? Okay. Thanks for the question. So actually, because we, I just had eight minutes, so I focused on sojourners. But yes, my lab also works on high altitude adaptation. And yes, these uh, the natives have SNPs. So that is what we have seen in genes like EPAS1 and EGLN1. We have seen that natives have natural selections that is going on, which is different from the uh, populations of lowlanders. So yes, they do have. OK. And uh, 
eventually do these uh, people adapt with these mutations eventually adapt or are they always remain susceptible y yes so speci uh, specifically to uh, tibetan people what we have seen that they have functional adaptations so they have higher lung capacities they have lower hemoglobin lower hemoglobin as in the hemoglobin level similar to the sea level yeah. because we when we'll go there and we'll stay for you know one month or two month our hemoglobin will shoot but yes. we know that with the hemoglobin comes the side effects also so in that way they have the functional adaptations yeah so if they don't adapt would you recommend some kind of a screening procedure to ensure that such people when they go high altitude you know do not fall sick so for sojourners for example for uh, the you know the military people we have our lab aim to have a screening panel where we can actually you know it uh, it reduces the stress and cost so if we can somehow have the screening panel for screening the people who will be better adapted going to altitude and better perform so the that chair said is uh, when the army goes to high altitude would that be something that yes yes as, right? definitely and that is actually that uh, that is why it's such a strategic uh, important area and therefore preparedness is important um uh, the other chair asked here is that you showed uh, changes in egln1 uh, regulation expression and so is there any idea why the uh, expression is levels are higher why is it up so basically since it was a case control set setup and we found that people sojourners who were susceptible to this disease they had higher level but in healthy controls it was uh, the levels were not that higher so we assume that there is some you know susceptibility going on or predisposition going on that is making their levels higher and therefore this higher level is uh, in, uh, involved with the uh, pathogenesis and uh, due to which the hif activation is not done properly and therefore the disease this is we have seen in case control setup different okay. uh, you, you showed that methylation is lower at the promoter of this gene in the uh, hip patients and uh, i was thinking is that the only reason why expression is higher or i mean say this is a correlation you you have it but uh, in terms of mechanism is that sufficient Uh, to induce the expression so definitely it's not sufficient because we know it's a complex regulation that is going on so therefore we focused what we found was that this particular region it had the cpg island methylation was were, uh, was higher and the same region had variants also okay okay so now we have at least two mechanisms that it could be genetic as well as epigenetic mm. that may be involved in the regulation of the gene but definitely there could be much more much more yeah. I have a last one last question for Zhuling. Um, she showed really uh, nice that the implants uh, uh, has really good uh, properties. Um, so the question was, is this now being used in implants and surgical equipments? Is it coming uh, to to where the surgical whether they, whether they coating it with tannic acid? But I am afraid. Uh, do we have the speaker here? No. It was a very interesting piece of work, but I don't think. Uh, speaker is online all right um are there any further questions second question third question yeah shiva this is to the last speaker i uh, i was wondering uh, you showed that uh, after using these different materials that there are the weight is kind of almost uh, stable and you don't see too much of a change in the weight right that was one of the graphs that you showed right so i was wondering uh, did you look at any other markers of stress or somewhat local inflammations or anything after using this okay thank you for a question of course first we uh, researched the irritated effect and allergic effect on the skin because our uh, product they use it that uh, household uh, injury remedy it's used it now as a remedy it's a product and um, our product they stay in the skin only 24 hours and after 24 hours it's fully be degraded from skin mm. that's why we don't uh, uh, check the uh, long uh, action of the product on the skin mm. one more question i was wondering why did you uh, propose this as an emergency only why can't it be used uh, if it lit maybe little bit modifications to for a more longer term okay thank you for your question uh, this project was started in 2018 it was started like a startup project it was my startup project and we started this project for uh, emergency effect uh, because uh, I have to start and when the, uh, the children they fall on that and the blood flow that's why we need something which externally stops the blood and close the injure 
and that's why we choose this product and polymer they form a well sustainable film and this film they uh, stop at the plum and it's uh, fully waterproof it means that uh, with this film we can uh, have a shower, have a swim, and after 24 hours, it bears degraded. And uh, for more better effect, we use nanoparticles of silver because sometimes it may be some bacterial in the injure. And uh, second, we use pantanol because pantanol can have effect for better, uh, uh, for better uh, skin uh, refresh refreshing. I have a question for uh, Sorish Ghosh. Uh, in your EDIM st uh, virus study, you saw that the virus mainly replicated in the ductal epithelial cells uh, compared to all the other cell types in the SMG cell population. So my question is when you set up infection in your salispheres generated from the mouse gland, did you see a similar preference for cell type? So yeah, actually uh, the salispheres are having the epithelial cells in majority compared to the immune cells, uh, but it uh, can be developed in, like with, with the immune cells, it can also be co-cultured and uh, the effects can be seen. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? Can we start for the theme discussion now? So thank you all for such an interactive question and answer session. Now at this occasion, we would like you to invite all for a thoughtful discussion on the theme of disease biology and healthcare, where we can summarize the insights we have gained from our session today and draw parallels between the ongoing research across the various countries. We kindly request all the speakers from our thematic session today to take the stage for this discussion. The participants who have joined online may turn on their videos for the discussion. During this session, we look forward to having a fruitful discussion on the challenges we face in the field of disease biology and healthcare currently in our respective countries and the work on how to overcome the obstacles of funding. Let us also put our opinions forward about the unique expertise each of the participating nations have achieved in the field and how we can actively collaborate and help each other. It's my great pleasure to now introduce the session chairs, Professor Hemlata Balram and Dr. Kushagra Bansal. Professor Hemlata Balram obtained her PhD from Indian Institute of Science and carried out her postdoctoral research at the University of California. After a brief stint at Astra Research Center in India, she joined JNCSR in 1996 as faculty fellow and now is, and is a professor since 2008. She was the Dean of Academic Affairs from 2008 to 11 and has been the Dean of Faculty Affairs since 2015. Professor Balram is a biochemist with several years of experience in the area of molecular parasitology, metabolism in parasitic protozoa, molecular enzymology and protein structure function analysis. The focus of research in her laboratory is on understanding biochemical pathways and metabolism in the malarial parasite plasmodium and on the protein structure function analysis of enzymes involved in purine nucleotide synthesis and fumarate metabolism in the parasite. Coming to our next chair, Dr. Kushagra Pansal, he obtained his PhD in Microbiology and Cell Biology from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore in 2010. He joined Harvard Medical School, Boston for postdoctoral research in 2011. During his postdoctoral tenure, he sought to delineate the molecular basis of immune tolerance mechanisms that operate in the thymus. Dr. Bansal returned to India in 2018 to join Molecular Biology and Genetics Unit at Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, Bangalore as a new faculty member. He was awarded Ramalingam Rees Fentry Fellowship of the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. Now, I invite the chairs to take over the session. Um, All the online part, sorry. 
all the online participants we request you to please switch on the camera and can actively participate in the discussion uh, good afternoon one and all um, it's indeed a great pleasure to co-chair this session along with my colleague uh, dr kushagra um, i'm sure you'll agree with me that over the past uh, two hours or more we have had very interesting series of lectures ranging from uh, communicable diseases, infectious diseases, to non-communicable diseases, and also to development of uh, uh, therapeutic agents, which are of different kinds. Um, so what one, the feeling that one gets is that the, the eight nations which are participating in this meeting have all got the potential to carry out and collaborate on a wide range of subjects which range from conducting basic research on looking at a particular infectious organism or a non-infectious disease in, uh, in humans to development of therapeutic agents ranging from vaccine to drugs to also, uh, you know, laser therapy, whether laser therapy is better or a non-laser procedure is better or development of glasses or uh, lenses for the eye, so on and so forth. So um, before we start the discussion, I'll just ask Kushagra to say a couple of things. Uh, I echo with Professor Balram, and uh, uh, there were a lot of talks, and uh, it was very nice to hear from all of you. And some of you have traveled uh, across nation. So thank you very much for doing so. So we heard talks on uh, various uh, aspects of biology, as Professor Balram mentioned. And one thing uh, I would like to mention that uh, there were two groups of talks, I will say. One, one which focused on basic research, and the other group of talk, I can say, uh, uh, was having the theme of uh, translational research, as, as, as we heard the talk on cornea transplantation or ultrasound. Uh, which we can use for uh, osteoarthritis. Uh, and I feel uh, there is a gap here. So I'll start uh, with a question here that how do we fill this gap? If anybody, or any one of you want to attempt that? You mean, uh, thank you. You mean the filling the gap between uh, fundamental research Correct. and the translation Correct. research? Correct. I think uh, obviously the fundamental research the core uh, has a core base for uh, having a translation research, and they both should go side by side. And Correct. there is no way uh, like you know the translation research can be done without a fundamental research. And uh, uh, by what the differences between the developed nations and the developing nations in terms of uh, fundamental research and translation research is that. Most of the fundamental research are in like in the US and other places are they are associated with the clinics. So these are like hospitals have their own research centers and the hospitals are like in the universities, they have hospitals in universities. So there's a proper system where hospitals, clinicians get engaged with the fundamental research and researchers. So that way, whatever if there's some clinical uh, you know challenge, so they discuss with their fundamental researchers if they can have a solution for it. And if the fundamental researcher finds something, you know, which may have potential of translation, they go back to them and back and forth by these collaborations and these interactions. I think these are the key. Anybody else wants to add on? Uh, yeah, I, I also completely agree with this uh, model of medical colleges associated with uh, basic science uh, thing. And also, like, as we are moving towards international, like, uh, the collaboration between different nations. Different nations have different uh, endemic problems, endemic diseases uh, that can be collaborated. And also in cases of viruses, uh, particularly in my field, uh, there are like uh, there are uh, particular virome projects uh, going on in the Western uh, world. Not so much a uh, virome project has been taken up uh, in the Southeast Asian countries or Asian countries per se. Uh, those kind of projects uh, need to be taken up very seriously because we have to 
uh, be two steps ahead of these virus, uh, new virus strains, because we cannot be following up uh, with an infection and then identifying the strains. We should be uh, trying to identify those strains which are uh, getting persistently uh, passed on to uh, one generation to another, because the microbiome is there uh, to support many of the viruses which are which may be non-infectious at this stage, but may uh, with the uh, mutations in uh, immunocompromised people, they can turn over into uh, infectious strains and then there may be a spillover in the population. So those uh, with international collaborations, uh, these uh, aspects can be taken care of. I'd like to make a point with regard to what you said just now. Uh, the Indian Council of Medical Research has started a huge project with a huge finance support from the government on you know, viral genome sequencing. So uh, this is it started in India, and for the past, I would say, one year, this has been going on. Activity for there is an activity for SARS-CoV-2 genome sequencing, and the consortium was uh, instituted in India called Insacoc, and uh, GNC is also part of that, and uh, we have been sequencing. So there are sporadic uh, uh, attempts to do that, but yeah, I agree that uh, the holistic picture needs to change uh, towards that. Yeah. Uh, that's another point to it. India has also started, not just uh, through INSACOG. ICMR has independently started sequencing uh, viral genomes and also bacterial pathogens, which are you know springing up in hospitals so that we are uh, ahead before the pathogen can invade the rest of human population. Yeah, so it, it's been initiated. Um, I hope that the gap which is now existing between the basic science and uh, clinical science, I hope is temporary. Because if to say about ophthalmology anyway, um, the basic science is our future, the future of all medicine. Uh, because for example, we have already got um, some very good medicines uh, which can stop AMD, age-related age -related macular degeneration, uh, which came from basic science and from um, oncology and these uh, medicines are really very effective and they help people to see better and further of course we would like to get uh, cloned endothelial cells and um, limbal stem cells or if we don't need if we don't have a necessity to take uh, these cells from donor there will be no immune response and the results will be much higher and we are not going to have a donor. So anyway, the future is with basic science, I'm sure. May I? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. OK, uh, of course, all our knowledge, the basic, of the, uh, basic it's uh, uh, theoretical knowledge. But sometimes the researchers, they go deep in the time. And they cannot stop because they uh, search perfect point of, of their opinion. And when we make use of some uh, practice, we predict that these researches, we don't need so deep researches. Sometimes for useful, these methodics or for, for those products or some remedies, um, we, make, uh, we make some predict that uh, maybe we will not, uh, not use uh, some articles from Nature Journal or another journal, but we use how uh, people will adapt these methods, how people uh, can, uh, th they must pay the film, yes? How, uh, is, uh, is it ready for pay for these methods? And second, uh, is it our hospitalists or government ready for adapt this method in the government on the, uh, in the country too? Because sometimes, of course, the uh, knowledge and researches is new, but equipment is not every time ready to adapt these methods. I would like to make a point here to what you said. Uh, there was this talk uh, from a group in Russia, I think, on the use of lasers to do a corneal transplant. Uh, it was not very clear as to why you know, lasers were not being used in a widespread manner, and people were resorting to a technique which was less effective as the talk pointed out. So there it's a question of making suitable instruments which can be utilized in a clinical setting. And uh, in terms of uh, manufacturing of these instruments, I must point out here that uh, um, similar to vaccine manufacturing, India also has been going ahead in manufacturing of these uh, equipments 
which are useful for, for surgical purposes and other clinical purposes. Okay, thank you. I will ask as biology, uh, I, as biotechnologists, because in our biotechnology it's uh, differently separate from other uh, other lines. Because in our biotechnology we have only economic effect. If our product have an eff economic effect, it's not eff effective. Uh, when we adopt some methods or equipment or so product, we also collect economic effect. As that's why when you choose some. Um, um, uh, when you choose some, when we choose some uh, solvents or in other components, we also call it all economic effect, and that's why when something, uh, uh, when so, uh, and so, um, and that's why uh, when uh, something they uh, recommended us use another companies, of course we collect. Uh, in our search, we try to use our local companies and uh, it, it, it will be easier for researcher, and second, it will be uh, more native for the people. Maybe we move on to the next question. Uh, so uh, what I see is uh, the research in current age is interdisciplinary, and I'm pretty sure all of the panelists will agree to that. Uh, we can't restrict ourselves to just being biologists. A biologist has to be a physicist, a chemist, a theoretical person as well. Uh, and a lot of research nowadays is data-driven. Uh, as uh, someone mentioned that uh, we need to generate databases to understand uh, how, how do we tackle the diseases. So how uh, this uh, SCO can, uh, in the countries involved in SCO can help each other to access the data across countries and uh, uh, kind of design better therapies for the future. So I I I'm, I don't know much of the uh, technicalities between that, but it may be uh, suggested that uh, uh, institution like uh, DST or DBT. Uh, or CSIR can bring a uh, call for projects which is uh, going to handle the technical uh, things uh, of data transfer between two nations. And uh, by that way, it, uh, things can be streamlined for uh, researchers to be talking to each other between uh, those nations and like call for proposal kind of thing and bringing the scientists together. Point you make, uh, uh, but my question was a little broader. That nowadays every country I feel wants to hold on their data, and how do we utilize a good data which can help each other? I mean, say one con data in one country can help the other country to design better therapies. So, so th that uh, like that again, like uh, it is, it is again a research uh, problem that uh, the re uh, the re uh, two scientists have to figure out Correct. at at that point like how this uh, some tropical disease is uh, going to be of help in uh, temperate climate uh, thing yeah. so i'll take i'll take this question as an opportunity because i am in high altitude uh, disease uh, field and uh, we know that Hima so a lot of country uh, who is in seo as an organization, uh, they have various mountain ranges, Himalaya, we know, then they have celestial mountain ranges, which is in Kazakhstan and Tajikistan and all that. So I'll, uh, this is my, uh, this is, I'll take this as an opportunity to, you know, uh, welcome all the collaborations where we can actually let, if not data sharing, but at least we can see the markers that we get in our population. So we have very different population. Ethnically, they are very different. But we need a global marker. We need a marker which could be have which have a global which have a you know could be used as a diagnostic marker in all the populations besides the ethnicity and all that. So that could be tested. And since we all have good uh, you know high altitude regions, so that way we can uh, you know we can think. And that was the reason I actually also came uh, for this uh, summit. And uh, apart from that. Uh, the, of course, uh, if if it's possible, then data sharing would be really good. The yeah. it's a policy decision, I think, uh, hmm. uh, which which data sharing is policy decision. It uh, <laughs> goes beyond individual scientists. Okay, I want to tell about our. Uh, we have Minister of Innovation Development in our country, 
and uh, every per month, uh, the ministry, they open the grants. These grants are given for two countries. For example, Uzbekistan, uh, India grants has opened just two months before. It means that we have data and researcher from India, he came open the data of Uzbekistan and find uh, developer researcher from Uzbekistan in the same field. And uh, they together uh, write some project and uh, this project will realize in two countries. It means that it will be collaborated between two countries and they also uh, make some um, project will, uh, which will be used in two countries too. And we have same projects in uh, many countries of CCO. Good point you make that only on th those two months you, you can access each other's data. But uh, I think there is a need now that uh, uh, countries which are neighbor at least uh, should be able to access the data because diseases don't see boundaries basically. Yes, of course, but sometimes, you know, these researchers, they're afraid that sometimes will keep their team. And <laughs> when young researchers came to the professor and said, what are you doing? You don't, you don't mind, it's not your problem, I will do myself. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> the professor too, they're afraid to give some information from their projects. I think uh, this meeting actually gives us opportunity to, you know, to cross those barriers. And uh, see, for example, I'm, I'm telling you about the cancer, so, we are still using the model. I think all the globally we are using the model which we are getting from US because all this Correct. online is everything Correct. has come from US. Correct. But if you see, like you know, in India has three times higher triple negative breast cancer than that of US, and uh, in the US it is normally for mostly in the you know black population. But in India the major problem is like you know this triple negative breast cancer where the one of after diagnosis of life is hardly six months. So it is found in the ladies who are below age thirty. So you're younger age here, so, and it is totally different. So that's why the CSR has initiated now Pan India, you know, genomic uh, project. So we are rope, we have roped in like four hospitals right now from Mumbai, Kolkata, and uh, we are also including now the Kashmir in that. Correct. So we are trying to understand uh, how we are genetically different from Correct. from the you know Hispanic population, so that we can have our own you know Correct. maybe there will be different mutations so where the drugs which we are using may not work. And that's actually the clinical problem. And I think this platform, because we are not going far away, so it is like there's a very close boundary hmm. countries. So I think there should not be, if these are diseases which really need. So hmm. they, as you said, they are across, they don't need borders. Correct. So like we have started in India, the same thing if can be started in those countries and data can be shared. So maybe the work we do here can be beneficial to them and the work they do there can be beneficial to us. And at least we can have this South Central Asia, we can have something uh, concrete in the next four or five years. Correct. Yeah, that makes sense. Any other point one of you all would like to make? Uh, thank you very much. Its section is uh, very, very, very uh, uh, interesting and it's interdisciplinary. Uh, you have, uh, 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 has uh, basically uh, microbiology, biology, and other disciplinary. And it will uh, help to uh, understand uh, some uh, problems uh, and uh, to uh, start to correct diagnosis for us. Uh, and uh, I think um, in this section to help to us, not doctors, but biology, microbiology, and other persons to uh, correct uh, the other, to correct diagnosis and to correct protection the other diseases, non-infection and infection diseases too. And thank you very much. So I was thinking that if I ask the panelists over here, you know, if you if you are to suggest two themes on which the countries can now start uh, collaborating, what would you choose? Uh, two countries. Yeah. yeah. For example, she mentioned diagnostics. Yeah. You need various kinds of diagnostics for different kinds of diseases. So, what would you think are the two major necessities of this region in terms of biomedical? You know infectious, non-communicable non diseases, what are the two major requirements on which, you know, we can start a paperwork and take it forward from there on? Three, it could be more. 
so uh, if i i may suggest is like since uh, we have seen this uh, uh, global uh, epidemic uh, one of the things will be uh, infectious diseases and not only restricting to viruses but also other uh, protozoa or fungal diseases drug resistant pathogens uh, yes drug resistant pathogens and the other things will be like surely from the cancer uh, field uh, which uh, like they can share uh, what are the genetic uh, issues of these regions are having in common is there any specific genetic predisposition in this area which which yeah uh, i think uh, asia central asia and uh, india we have like you know the number one cancer right now is breast cancer and uh, it is like you know increasing incidence in the, all the countries so india has recently surpassed the cervical cancer and breast cancer became the number one cancer and the same is the story with the china and uh, though there's a lung cancer deaths are more and the same i have read before coming here the central asia and so other asian countries are facing the threat of breast cancer i think uh, that at least we can start from that mm. and uh, then many more participants can actually european and we can just take it forward of looking at epidemiology uh, within these I nations? I think everything, what, whosoever, because we cannot keep it restricted to one-to-one. -one. I think we should rope in epidemiology, the drug resistance in it, and how the genomic, you know, details so that we can share. genomics. Genomics also. Epidemiology and, and genomics. Absolutely, and so that uh, we can also see how diagnostic markers we can have, how therapeutic. What about manufacture of cheap diagnostics? I mean, so that we don't depend on... Uh, Right. The first, more expensive the ones, as she absolutely. said, the economy plays a role. Yeah. The first thing is like we don't know what sort of uh, genetic alterations are in these countries and uh, what is going on. So first step, we should start from there. So does uh, get our you know genetic information of our population, and that can lead us. So whether we have to what diagnostic we can you know go from there or what therapeutics options we have from there. I think we should have a multiple approach in this. So I actually echo with him. And as you said, if one thing comes to your mind, so I'll say cardiometabolic disorders, because right now one of the projects which I'm in is CSR initiated, the predictive risk markers for cardiometabolic disorder in a countrywide uh, cohort. So it's a basically cohort for CSR employees. We are trying to collect 10,000 uh, individuals. Um, and we are trying to do a lot many things. And the objective, major objective is to understand or to find out the predictive cardio cardiometabolic risk uh, predictors, basically, that is the objective. So, and as uh, our uh, Honorable Minister mentioned, that this SEO actually contribute around 42% uh, of the world population. And the data which we have, which we refer, is basically Caucasian. So, the ob objective for CSR cohort is that only, at least we should have a reference range for us, right? Even, uh, for and example, if, uh, you know, your... Uh, LDL is 200. So it's if it, even if it's 210, the doctor says, "Oh, you have the high LDL." We don't know our LDL Correct. range. Correct. And like for HDL, uh, uh, the range is it should be above 40. But it seems in uh, Asian population that's not the norm. Correct. So so that numbers have that those numbers have to change. Basically. Correct. So true for everything, including <laughs> your vitamin D levels when people Absolutely. check B12. Everything is for. You know, so we are study done uh, in Central Europe or a study done in the US. Absolutely. So with that objective, we are actually trying to see a lot many biochemical parameters, including the scanning and everything. So that kind of data we are going to have in next five years. Now, if we, you know, the other countries of SEO, if we can all come together and we can have a data for Asia, Central Asia, that could be a really, really uh, important, uh, you know, uh, as a SEO, we can have that objective. Uh, when we know that this is something which we are going to achieve in five to ten years, so that's an SO, that's our glo uh, local problem that we can <laughs> that we can address. <laughs> I fully agree, and uh, I cannot choose someone from full, but uh, maybe we uh, can uh, reach reach this fair by using some new technologies at artificial intelligence because we all tell about the. Uh, Pandemia, but before pandemia, we have a cancer and the oids before, and uh, b before pandemia from cancer and oids, people died. Maybe artificial intelligence can help, uh, help us to predict some um, issues. How say uh, our my colleague? And uh, sometimes uh, using the, this data between the countries, it also helped to predict the issues on some pandemic uh, in the different countries too. 
and uh, sorry after the no uh, how uh, after no is cancer is bad uh, uh, in non infection or infection disease uh, we must know before them uh, how much patients we have cancer or infection or infection in our country it's a problematic because uh, we need some uh, new programs which registration cancer central program uh, which is extension infection, non-infection, particular in diagnostics too. In Europe, uh, have a program MRI, CT, ultrasounds, the totally registration date system, uh, similar PACS, uh, and picture ICAM and communication system. But in our country, we don't have it. It's this system, uh, we may registration, we find uh, Madumarova and uh, which uh, the dead ultrasound on CT analysis in, we may say, we may see in, uh, all, all hospital in uh, Bangalore in, or in Delhi. Uh, and it's uh, registration, it, this disease is uh, pro problematic. Uh, and it's um, actually in our research in our country. You mentioned one important point that maybe AI uh, can be a thing which we can utilize to uh, diagnose better. Uh, so uh, maybe that's that's the future. Uh, but how do we deal with the ethical issues which are associated with AI itself right now? Because uh, you know, a recent emergence of uh, Chat GPT has, has led to some situations. So uh, how, how do we tackle that issue? I mean, say. Uh, where we balance that we don't cross the line and, and we utilize it to the benefit of ourselves. If somebody has uh, something to reflect on that. Chat GPT is open access AI. Correct, correct, correct. That also needs some policy decisions, obviously. If, if somebody wants to say something, yeah. Yes, uh, chat GPT, uh, suppose it is giving some response or some output, then we need human being to identify whether it is correct or not. So human being cannot be, uh, I think, separated out or omitted. So it will always remain in the scenario. And in, in chat GPT also, there is human component. It is taken. So all, all the knowledge, whatever is available, it has been fed into chat GPT, that AI system. So human being cannot be eliminated from the system. That's what I want to say. Yeah, yeah, that would make sense. I think uh, uh, we can close the session now. And I thank all the participants for uh, actively uh, getting involved in this discussion and most importantly, giving the talks uh, and uh, illuminating us uh, with the knowledge. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, my co-chair, Professor Balram, uh, for being there for me and uh, the organizers for uh, choosing us to uh, preside here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairs. And uh, at this occasion, uh, we would like to present the Chairs with a small token of appreciation. I invite Dr. Hemdata Balram and Dr. Kushagra Bansal to kindly receive a token of appreciation on our behalf. You go on that side. Yeah. Dr. Kushagra Bansal, thank you. So just to extend, uh, uh, while we are on this theme, everybody is thinking how we can collaborate and take it forward. I think what better uh, to hear from the country coordinators whom we are rel relying on to show us the way forward. So I would like to start with uh, Dr. Kumar here. Um, and then if anybody else also has to say something, uh, we should always think about how we can come together. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ravi. Good evening. I am Arvind Kumar from Department of Science and Technology. 
yesterday somehow i missed to mention uh, regarding uh, one of the very key important information or you can say idea that uh, see uh, in the panel discussion we are discussing the challenges among the sco member state and their possible way out so in that regard we request all the thematic panel not only the disease biology or energy there are five thematic panel uh, they should come up with a one page note note indicating the what are the challenges you want to take it and what are the possible ways to proceed further like whether you want after this conclave you want further workshop further access to each other research facility or you want some kind of other support in the form of joint project so um, by tomorrow evening like you are the, this panel is already here today they have also met similar fashion so they should come up with uh, one pager note indicating the point which i am uh, i have had highlighted and then we can discuss in a group a small group and take it further for future collaboration so that will be that will give us a kind of broad uh, road map where we should move forward after this conclave so that information or idea i just wanted to float so that we should have something in black and white also Correct. from the government point of view and from your point of view also that people have expect that what will happen after this whether this is a stand alone event huh? yeah design yeah. development and manufacture of affordable diagnostics uh, we are dependent so much on things that are coming from developed countries they become very expensive if you have to cover the populations of you know developing countries so it would mean novel ways of thinking of making diagnostics affordable so you can't use the same strategy that's being used which makes a diagnostic very expensive you have to make it cheap yeah so that is one of the very important area for country like india or sco and also well, opens up you know a lot of uh, economic uh, re uh, revenue revenue comes in for all the yeah. countries all the yeah, countries yeah. she said economy plays a major role yeah. in all this so we wanted to uh, get ideas from the young researcher so <laughs> they should they may have altogether different also because somebody was telling that basic research still is a, a you can say prerequisite to go forward for translational research unless until you have the strong basic research you cannot think for the translational research in true sense so uh, we are open to their ideas and whatever you have suggested we will keep that into also in mind that uh, whether we can have some plan for collaboration for design development and manufacturing of affordable biomedical devices in our sco space or region you so mean thank that you. Uh, within uh, this uh, group that we should find uh, some compatible partners and come up with some ideas and proposals which we can no, write on a bit no suppose that you are the six people sitting together you may have other uh, people from ai artificial intelligence computer science or the energy group or any group you make a group of four five people and just propose what you want to do in the seo format okay. as simple i think it's a great idea one of the things that fires and others have been discussing is that over lunch and tea breaks um, we should so, sit uh, basically theme based sitting across countries so that you can discuss more about the research maybe something that we can and, do and uh, just to uh, just to make your life simple also if now you people are from one group like speak some digit biology you some of uh, means one of our two may take the responsibility yeah, that you will coordinate you like and come up with some kind of uh, abstract one pager that okay we we have discussed among ourselves we wanted to work on this in collaborative mode and this project has the it's the relevance for the seo region okay thank you thank you yeah
Yes, uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Science and Higher Education of the Russian Federation, I would like to add that uh, we are uh, really glad uh, that you are always open to share your ideas. And uh, biology, uh, especially not only in the sphere of bio biodiversity, but also different um, spheres such as um, spreading of diseases and uh, COVID-19 and so on and so forth. So it's of course very important uh, to spread your ideas, to find any solutions, how to solve it. And uh, uh, the most important thing is to do it uh, together. So uh, I would like to say only that we are always open to your ideas, uh, to cooperation and maybe uh, especially for young scientists and innovators, if you have some ideas, uh, uh, don't be shy <laughs> to tell me about it. And uh, we will be ready maybe to communicate and uh, to create something new, which is uh, which is really will be helpful uh, and uh, useful. That's it. Yeah, I have the same opinion, so I just uh, want to show, express uh, the intention to collaborate between uh, the countries of SEO organization uh, in all sectors that uh, we are presented here also. And that would be great uh, achievement here also to uh, find a topic for future uh, uh, international collaboration, international project. Uh, between uh, all those Thank countries you. that are presented here in uh, each uh, sector, in each, in each section. And uh, also, yeah, uh, would like to show the openness of uh, Kazakhstan to all uh, kind of uh, uh, collaboration and contact. Thank you. If you allow me, I would like add some kind of things. On behalf of Minister of Innovative, uh, not it before, but nowadays it's Minister of Higher Education, Science, and Innovation of the Republic of Uzbekistan. Also, they support uh, cooperation between young scientists. Also, world, as mentioned, Bernard Khajaeva. In our country, we cooperate with other countries in all visits of our dignitaries. Um, half of life investment from our country, half investment from the other co opposite country, and they implement their projects in two countries. So as and for example, if you could make some kind of paper and cooperate together, our ministries, of, I'm sure they will support because I already talked with them about this one. If you work like one team, we already practice, have practice, uh, practiced this one in our countries around five years, as I know, but at the first stage, it was so difficult. But I'm happy to know that nowadays it's, we should, um, support each other, especially SEO countries. And Ms. Borno mentioned that young scientists are a little bit afraid about this one. But who's not afraid? You shouldn't be afraid. We should develop our societies, we should develop our countries. We should develop, for, uh, we should work for our citizens. So. Okay. And I want to add, uh, if it's possible, maybe we will take some table with all contact, because here we uh, contact with in, in from one section, but maybe tomorrow I'll be find some information and I'm asking all oh, some guy from Hidei here uh, work by artificial intelligence in this sphere. That's why maybe we will, ch uh, may maybe I will find his contact from this table for future projects. Yeah, we are anyway have that entire list of all emails and contacts are there with countries. We'll do it and we'll also take what everybody's been saying. Maybe we could have a round table where team wise people, speakers can sit together, maybe online, offline, and have a nice chat. Okay? Yeah. Last uh, good news is that at the government level, we have already agreed for supporting the R&D project and mechanism for supporting the R&D project has already been approved at the highest level. And so in coming means few months or uh, you will see that there may be some announcement for the joint call. And it has been uh, means approved 
in the presidency of Uzbekistan in the we call I think it was sixth uh, fifth science and technology ministers meeting where we have already signed the document for supporting the joint project. So you have a lot of opportunity to come and therefore you have to start your homework from today evening. Thank you. Thank you everyone for a very engaging um, meeting and it's very nice to see that everybody is willing to work together and we'll find some way. But now it's also time uh, to see what you can do in Bangalore that you guys have come. So the man of the moment is Mr. Singh here. Um, Singh is king. Yes, that's how he's known. So uh, we have a city tour arranged for you. And uh, what you're going to see up on the screen is some somewhere where uh, Dr. Singh is going to take you. And hopefully, he'll bring you back to the hotel as well. So your dinner is scheduled at the hotel. OK? And he's going to tell you more about today's tour. He's our most safest and reliable and trustworthy things. I would highly recommend to go with him and not take individual trips uh, alone. It's not very advisable. Okay, Here's Dr. Singh. Namaskara, Bangalore. So this is a typical way of welcoming the delegates. Honored to be with the scientists here. I'm sure that it gives a great moment for us to be learning and be strong. And I, on behalf of the team, our team especially, are so delighted right from, in fact, 15 days past. We have been working together with Dr. Saab, and he's been a great guiding force along with Dr. Arvind Saab to make this event happen today, and you see it all. Right from pickup from airport, your hospitality hotel, it's all, I should say, the great work of this team. But I'm sure now moving out from science, now I have to take you to some fiction so that you see something of Bangalore right from day one. The team has been looking out. Can we see Bangalore and other places? So the moment has come. Yes, I would like to definitely take you a little bit of show up Bangalore, but all depends on the time and traffic because the main purpose of coming here is about science. That is more important. But along with that, you have this uh, beautiful part of Bangalore. You must be knowing Bangalore, the actual name was Balanduru. But Britishers were not able to digest that name. They told Balandu, what is Balanduru? This is not a name, bang, bang it. So they named it, they stretched it more longer and they made it Bangalore. It's called Bangalore, not Balandur. Actual name was Balandur. It's a story again, which my guides who are efficient will take you around and show and discuss about that too. And in detail, I will not go because your time is precious. And more important, what uh, subject, what you have come. And Bangalore, we will definitely, after high tea, take you around, which will be for at least two hours. Battling the traffic also, we need your cooperation. And uh, Namma Bangalore. Namma Bangalore means our Bangalore, which will, in fact, we will have this program around 4, 4.30, we'll leave. And then we will see the Parliament House. Not from front, we'll try to take permission. If we get, we will definitely go in, or else we will try and cross around as an orientation tour of Vidhan Soda. And then coming the uh, High Court, followed by uh, Kaban Park, you'll see greenery around. But Bangalore, let me tell you, was about 40 years back, was looking like JNCSR. They have preserved it. Bangalore was like this 50 years back plus. And it is great honor to see you, what Bangalore was, so you can see for yourself. But today it is, yes, concrete. And moving forward, Kaban Park, Lal Bagh, these are the two gardens which are still existing to kind of you know show that, yes, it was called the Garden City once. It was called the Pensioner's Paradise. Now it is called the Vibrant City because of high-tech technology. So M Bangalore has moved on. And science, yes, all your, in fact, I should say, a lot of science institutes. All, I should say, science Department of Science has been giving this kind of support. So I'll not talk much. I'm not more a guide, but yes, definitely Bangalore is a lovable place for everyone. So I wish uh, and you have a more memorable and lovable time in Bangalore. Thank you very much. Take care and enjoy your time in there. There's uh, high tea outside. So before they go, we'll take a photograph and then we'll move on to the high tea.